Hello everyone. Welcome to our service today on Welcoming the Stranger, Some Thoughts on Migration. Whether you are here in our building or online, welcome. I'm Louise Reeve and I'm the worship leader here at Castle on Tyne Unitarians. As ever, we're being part of the service for people at the table to join us at the moment. The camera is focused only on me and on people doing reading. Let us begin, as we always do, uh, with the statement of the values we hold in common as we journey together here uh, in our spirituality, here in our community. We welcome all who seek the meaning of life and who believe that human spirituality is wider than any one tradition, deep than any one set of opinions. With a respect for our Christian origins, we seek to explore truths from sources. Fellowship gives us strength and encouragement in daily living. We'll now light our chalice. A light of places with acknowledgement to Jane R. Tolkien. We kindle our chalice flame. May it stand for the inner light that is given to us to be a light in the dark places, a light when all other lights are out. May it be so. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Our next reading is going to be read by Diana, but first let me introduce it. It is a poem called Home uh, by Ross and Shark. Some people know it as When Home is the Mouth of a Shark. Ross Shire was born in Kenya to Somali parents and lives in London. She is a poet, a writer, an editor and a teacher. In 2013-2014, she was a young poet laureate for London. Shire wrote Conversations about home at a deportation centre back in 2009, which was a piece inspired by a visit she made to the abandoned Somali embassy in Rome, which some young refugees had turned into their home. In an interview, she told a reporter that the night before I visited, a young Somali had jumped to his death off the roof. The encounter, she says, opened her eyes to the harsh reality of living as an undocumented refugee in Europe. She said, I wrote the poem for them, for my family and for anyone who has experienced or lived around grief and trauma in that way. This poem became the basis for the poem Home, which we will hear shortly. 
It's been shared widely across the media and has been read in a range of public spaces, including Trafalgar Square in London. Commentators have noted that home has touched a nerve among people, that it has offered a way to give voice to refugees and provide us with some authentic understanding of the crisis. Home. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbours running faster than you. Breath bloody in their throats. The boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factory is holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one leaves home unless home chases you, fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. It's not something you ever thought of doing until the blade burnt threats into your neck. And even then you carried the anthem under your breath, only tearing up your passport in an airport toilet, sobbing as each mouthful of paper made it clear that you wouldn't be going back. You have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. No one burns their palms under trains, beneath carriages. No one spends days and nights in the stomach of a truck feeding on newspaper, unless the miles travelled mean something more than journey. No one crawls under fences, no one wants to be beaten, pitied. No one chooses refugee camps or strip searches where your body is left aching, or prison because prison is safer than a city of fire, and one prison guard in the night is better than a truckload of men who look like your father. No one could take it. No one could stomach it. No one skin would be tough enough. The go home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers, sucking our country dry, their hands out, they smell strange, savage, messed up their country and now they want to mess ours up. How do the words, the dirty looks, roll off your backs? Maybe because the blow is softer than a limb torn off. Or the words are more tender than 14 men between your legs. Or the insults are easier to swallow than rubble, than bone than your child's body in pieces. I want to go home, but home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of a gun. And no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore. Unless home told you to quicken your legs, leave your clothes behind, crawl through the desert, wade through the oceans, drown, save, be hunger, beg, forget pride. Your survival is more important. No one leaves home until home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave. Run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. In an interview after she won the Brunel University African Poetry Prize, Watson Shire was asked to talk about her sense of commitment to such urgent subject matter in her work. In response, she said, I am from Somalia, where there has been a war going on for my entire life. I grew up with a lot of horror in the backdrop, a lot of terrible things that have happened to people who are very close to me and to my country and my parents. So it's in the home and it's even in you. It's on your skin and it's in your memories and childhood. And my relatives and my friends and my mother's friends have experienced things that you can't imagine. And they've put on this jacket of resiliency and a dark humour. But you don't know what they've been victims of. 
or what they've done to other people. Them being able to tell me and then me writing it, it's cathartic being able to share their stories. Even if it's something really terrible, something really tragic, sometimes I'm telling other people's stories to remove stigma and taboo so that they don't have to feel ashamed. Sometimes you use yourself as an example. We're going to have some time for prayer, silence, and then some music. But uh, before we have our prayer, I'd like to introduce the music we're going to play. It's going to be a song by Elo uh, called The Blanket of Night. I'd like to say a little about the song in the words of Guy Guy, who is their lead singer, who wrote to migrants and holds an interviewer. It's about a couple at sea, refugees escaping a bad situation. When even some progressive parties campaigning on immigration, trying to make countries ill of such people, nothing has ever made me so angry. I wrote it in about when which held him from the gut. It's a husband and wife at a boat at night in a rough sea. I have put the lyrics on the back of the order of service and anyone wants to look at them when we have the song. He chose that to illustrate that while both political parties and many are blaming the country's problems on migrants, there are people who are dying to get in. As Garvey said, it's irresistible to blame migrants for problems. People who say that ought to be ashamed of themselves. So let's begin with a and by the Reverend Cliff Reed, then we'll have a couple of minutes of silence and a hung. It's easy to cry peace. It's easy to cry peace when we ourselves are not oppressed by tyranny. It's easy to invoke patience when our loved ones aren't in chains. It's easy to call for restraint when our children are free from fear. It's easy to be even headed when our brother is not being raped and our sister is not being tortured. It's easy to meld smooth pieties when cruelty and injustice are not our own eyes. It's easy to talk about realities when we use the protect. It's easy to debate rights and liberties when terrorists haven't strewn our streets with bloody broken bodies. It's easy to light candles when our family is burning or to sing sweet songs when hatred isn't screaming in our ears. It's easy to be sure we are far away and safe in our own certainties. Great spirit of love, don't let us use you to excuse our failure to relieve those who suffer torment at human hands. Don't let us use you as an excuse for our failure to make a difference where we can. Help us to do what we can where we are. Amen. This service has its roots in a great many sources. The most obvious one is the passing of the emergency motion, now resolution, at the Unitarian General Assembly in April, which calls us as a movement to oppose the government legal migration. The other roots as well, appropriately enough, are actually about to read from a book with roots in the title. It's Roots and Wings, a collection of writings from the Yorkshire Unitarian Union. Part of it, part of it was a rather more recent route, which was uh, earlier this week. We had uh, a peace workshop held at Brunswick Methodist Church uh, between ourselves, Newcastle Progressive Christian Network and Christian CND. Uh, much like this topic today, the prospect of nuclear weapons is not exactly a cheerful one. Uh, many of us were probably grateful for a cup of tea and a biscuit afterwards. I was aware when writing this service that this is not the easiest topic uh, to discuss, nor should it be. But obviously this is a space where we can all discuss things and if anyone needs support, we can get, we will, we will support people. But one of the insights uh, that struck with me, that struck with me after we had that peace workshop was the point someone made, which is nuclear weapons are not really the problem, which sounds like a rather counterintuitive thing to say when you're talking about something capable of fiery destruction and the poisoning of all of the Earth's natural resources. But nevertheless, that point was, nuclear weapons are awful, 
but really what they are is a symptom of a bigger problem, which is the unequal world we live in. A point that was made quite a few times there also was that people feel a genuine tension, a tension between the urge to get rid of these weapons of mass destruction and the fear that there are people out there we can't trust who don't have our best interests at heart and who, crucially in the context of that discussion, actually do have the power to act if they wish to conquer us, to take what we have, to attack us and to attack those we care about. I'd fair, I think it's fair to say that we did not resolve the situation of nuclear disarmament in a one hour discussion at Brunswick Methodist Chapel, it would have been nice. Um, but we did arrive at the realisation that as with all things, thinking carefully about what's involved never hurts. And another question someone asked was, if we did say that we needed some weapons for defence right now, do we need as many as we've got? Is there a time for what we need? Is there a time we need them for, after which we could say maybe we should revisit this? Should we look to work with other countries around the world to try and even out some of the inequality that drives suspiciousness? Should we strengthen the institutions we have around our world? Uh, because part of it, as someone pointed out, well, if Vladimir Putin goes off and invades Ukraine, it's not like when somebody goes and burgles my house. If someone burgles my house, I can try to drag them into court, but we don't have any such thing for the world. People have tried to create that and no doubt will keep trying to create that. But I think it was a very interesting discussion and I did want to mention it here, just because it showed that when we start to consider things in detail, we can sometimes start to see answers. Or sometimes we can start to see some more difficult questions, but at least asking the more difficult questions might get us closer to some of the answers. So here is a little from Roots and Wings. This one is titled, Send Them Home. A title I'm sure is meant with entirely an ironic intent. This was by Claire Lee. A clarification of terms. A refugee is someone who, from a fear of persecution, has had to leave the country they have been living in and has now been granted refugee status. An asylum seeker is someone who is awaiting a verdict as to whether or not they have been granted the status of refugee by the 1951 Convention on the Status as Refugees. An immigrant has come here to set up a better life for themselves and their families. An illegal immigrant is someone who risks everything to come here to find work through sheer desperation. They're often exploited from their journey's beginning to its often gruesome end. And then what happens? They seek asylum or work in a place where their beliefs, race and religion will, they hope, be accepted. They come to do jobs that often nobody else will do. This should be their journey's end, a place of sanctuary. Many make the assumption that these people are all illegal immigrants who have come here to take our jobs, our housing and to fill our schools with non-English speaking children. In reality, illegal immigrants generally live in overcrowded squalor, working long hours in jobs unacceptable to other people, for little pay, with lives dominated by gang masters. Some political parties prey on these views and create a moral panic with their rhetoric and leaflets, with drip feeding of fears and worries via the media. This whole attitude has not been helped by the debate going on pre-election about whether immigrants are an asset or a drain on our economy. But statistics often suggest that immigration since the year 2000 have benefited our economy rather than the reverse. The often heard comment is that something should be done about them. It should, we should try talking about and understanding different people's religions and cultures. Talking and listening to understand, not necessarily to agree. Being aware of why someone believes what they can do can take the fear out of differences. What are people so frightened of? Yes, times are economically very hard with food banks having to cope with more and more families needing the basic necessities in life. But we are still a rich country with freedoms other countries can often only dream about. Britain has been host to many different peoples and living in this country has always been a varied and colourful experience of different religions, traditions and cultures. 
uh, pausing there, I'm actually thinking of a service Diana did uh, some time back in which we looked at the music of black classical musicians and composers mm -hmm. whose work has often not been recognised but who, have, if we look closely, been present uh, throughout English history for a lot longer than people think and indeed in other countries. Uh, and my memory fails, but there was one who was a famous French composer who sadly was not able to take his talent as far as he might have been able to do had he not been black, but he left behind remarkable works of music. I'm aware, as I say that, that I might be focusing on that as if to say, well, look, some people, look at what people can bring to us, look at what they can do better than we do. The truth is, even if people came here and did nothing better than we did, they would still be our fellow human beings. Recently, we've heard the Archbishop Justin Welby challenging the government's migration bill, calling it morally unacceptable. It does not, there are many things he spoke about, uh, about what the things we've heard there about the scapegoating of people who try to come here, um, about the point here yeah, he made, which I think is a very good one, that the climate crisis alone could lead to at least 800 million more refugees by the year 2050. As he put it, even if this bill succeeds in temporarily stopping boats, and I don't think it will, it won't stop conflict or climate change. I could, I could go on and on about the political aspects of this, and being some, somebody somewhat involved in politics, it's quite tempting to do so. But I don't want to do that now. I want to return to our first reading read by Ben, in which we looked, those are the teachings of the Bible. As we say in our value statement, we originated as a Christian congregation. We now seek to learn truths from all sources. Those are some of the most famous uh, passages of the Bible for good reason. It's perhaps rather ironic, or maybe I simply find it bitterly ironic, that the first about the welcoming of the stranger, which seems so relevant to us here, saying, the stranger is a human being like you are. You were once people of Israel in the same position that the stranger is now. And as we would say today, any of us could be in that position. If we are here in this room, it's because we had the relative good fortune to be born here or to move here and to live here or for our ancestors to do that. Any of us could just as easily have been born in Iraq or Sudan or Ukraine or Afghanistan or any of the many, many countries around this world some plagued by war, some plagued by civil war, some plagued by conscription or religious repression, some where there is just very, very little chance of anything other than the most basic hard scrabble life unless you are prepared to risk everything to move. That is from Christianity, but, and I'm really not making a very original point here, but sometimes points don't need to be original to be worth making, which is the golden rule. Every religion, and I think every great religious teacher and leader, eventually converges around this truth. We are all human beings. Each of us is human. The Buddhist teachers say, do not hurt others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. In Islam, it is, none of you truly believes unless you love for your brother and sister what you love for yourself. In Judaism, it is, that which is hateful to you, do not do to another. That is the entire Torah, and the rest is its interpretation. Go study. We hear also in Hinduism the words, do not ever do to another person what you regard as injurious to yourself. This is the rule of Dharma. In the Baha'i say, do not lay on any person a load which you would not want to be laid upon you, and do not desire for anyone things you would not desire for yourself. In Confucianism, a student, Zigong, said, Is there a single saying that one may put in practice all one's life? The master said, That would be reciprocity. That which you do not desire, do not do to others. And I will mention Wicca, which, uh, because Wicca and Paganism and Shamanism, interestingly enough, are among some of the fastest growing spiritual practices in the UK. One of their rules is, Ever mind the rule of three. Three times your acts will return to you. This lesson well you must learn. You will only get what you earn. Or... So another root of this service, 
was that a while back on an online conversation about the way Unitarian goes, someone opened, this was actually in the context of the well-known Unitarian puzzle, how on earth do we get more people here? Someone said, here's a question, why should we welcome the stranger? And many people did talk about the need to welcome people in and make them feel welcome, to encourage them to seek out their spirituality. Um, it's perhaps rather ironic that whilst I began as a Christian and would possibly describe myself now as simply a Unitarian, I think I was actually the first person to say, well, in the old days, we would have said, because that's what Jesus wants us to do. And I think there is still a place for that. I think in here in our home, the Church of the Divine Unity, we increasingly think of the divine unity as that spirituality within. The old task of the person who stood at the front of the church uh, and increasingly might now be sitting in the circle in the church, the old task was to try and think for the congregation, what does God want us to do? I actually think that's still worthwhile, but I think it moves beyond reinterpreting one set of scripture. And if we take God as the ultimate spiritual truth within ourselves, whatever form that takes, because we are all individuals, it involves consulting that and thinking, what is it we're called upon to do as human beings? What can we do? And here I come back yet again to Christian scripture and that old saying, be as wise as serpents and as gentle as doves. That gentleness that the dove often used to symbolize the Holy Spirit, the spirituality within us, that side of us, which I think responded to what we heard from that young man trying to escape to Britain in a boat uh, and from Martin Shire's poem based upon all the experiences she has heard. I believe we all hear that and respond to that. But at the same time, I'm actually looking I'm not going to read out all the words of the government's responses to Archbishop Welby, you will be very happy to hear, but I am looking at that. And I come back to that wise as serpents. The serpent, after all, in the Garden of Eden was the being that said, if you take this, you will have knowledge. As we well know, when you take knowledge, it often comes with responsibility and with very hard choices. I'm sure I'm not the only one who loves Philip Pullman's work uh, on Northern Lights, because at one point he said, one of his inspirations was to think, was the Garden of Eden a prison? Should we celebrate Eve and the serpent for freeing us from it? Perhaps, but alongside that, we know that life became exceptionally hard for Adam and Eve, and we know also that they almost certainly weren't real people. It doesn't really matter because myths tell us a great deal about our human nature. But at that point, they had to make choices. They had to work hard. They had to rear their children. And some of those things were very difficult indeed. I come to think it's easier for us to be empathic, perhaps when we are in a position where we, where we may not be struggling so much ourselves. I'm not going to attempt to try to poem like Wallace and Shire because I like her gift, but sometimes, I don't know, I've worked in the public sector for a very long time and will probably be doing so. If I did write a poem, it would be something like, it is easy to see the hero when the hero is the lifeboat crew pulling the starving and, fright and frightened child from out of the waters. It is easy to see the hero when they go into the refugee camps and hand out the medicine and food. It's not always so easy to see the hero when that person sits in a committee and says, I really think we should spend this money on that. It will mean we can't spend it on this, but nevertheless, we should do that, knowing that that will be unpopular. It's not so easy to see the hero when the hero sits in the pub, overhears something said, we should all send them back and has the courage to speak up and say, really mate, what would you do if it was you and your family, knowing perfectly well that they will be shouted down and told to get lost? Someone once described the process of effective government as a very long and slow drilling through boards. In my line of work, we actually sometimes call it hard hat syndrome. People are very fond of any initiative where the politician involved, and I am being political here, but it often is the politician involved can stick on a viz jacket and a hard hat and say, look at this thing we have built. Whilst in the background, in this particular case, I'm thinking of a bunch of people were saying, yes, the bridge looks nice, but what we really needed were some better bus services. <laughs> in the same way, a lot of what is needed to try I'm not sure we can ever completely solve this problem. Humanity has moved around for as long as we've existed. But as with many insoluble problems, or seemingly insoluble problems, there are always things we can do 
to try to make things better. We can work with people in our local areas, we can educate ourselves, we can strive always to become better people.